One rarely referred to cosmological myth says that when man originally rebelled against God, as punishment, the big guy put man into a dazed, near hypnotic, near hypnotic state. But to his chagrin, quickly realized that men could generally tell little difference. Yeah. <clears throat> when life runs out of something to do, it resorts to habit. When life wants to perform at the max, it likewise resorts. And who is to pay the bill? Hmm. Funny, you should ask. Hmm. The man so approached the mystic. I've read that some before you have said they obtained not one thing from the great unequaled awakening to which the mystic replied, everyone has their view, but I'm not sure the man got it. At its most basic level, being civilized is in the mind having control over the instinctive functions. At a more advanced level, it is in the mind overseeing itself. And at this stage, a man is dead and done for, in so far as any personal development is concerned. A house divided against itself will stand quite nicely, thank you. <laughs> Tonight's transcendental fairy tale. A man got a mystic to sell him some enlightening medicine. But soon returned and said, I have no complaint with the medicine, but I do have a related problem. And to himself, the mystic said, oh shit, in a tone indicating recognition of what was to come. I can't remember to take it, said the man. To which the mystic replied, so why tell me? And the man replied, well, I thought maybe I could pay you to come around and remind me to take it. And to himself, the mystic then muttered, double shit. For your information, there are at least three alternatives to that final line of what the mystic said to himself when presented with the possibility of him taking charge of reminding other people to take the wake-up medication. You figure them out. There was once a man who had a pet, and he enjoyed it so much that he cut it in two so that he had twice the pets. <laughs> then he enjoyed the two so much that he cut one of them in two and had three. And he got so much pleasure from the three that he cut one of them in two again and then had four. And the process continued thusly with no sign of termination. But I do want to make one thing clear. After he cut the pet in two the first time, even though I said that he then continued the process due to the pleasure he received in doing so, this is not correct. Once the original division was made, after that, he had no choice. A creature divided against itself, although wobbly, can still stand and move about as necessary. Regarding the measurement of things, there is no width or height to summer. The body says it's either eat or be eaten. And the mind says it's either eat or eat or eat. Or eat, or eat. <laughs> at one level, those things that do not eat perish. While at another, one particular thing does it not eat ceaselessly, never comes into illusionary being to begin with. Where there is no limit to one's growth, one is in a strange world indeed. One is in the infinite merry-go-round of the mind. A man once paid a mystic to talk to him about mystical things. And after some time passed and his understanding increased, the man began paying the mystic not to talk to him about these matters. I think this was tonight's transcendental joke, I guess. Of course, it's much funnier if you take that all of this happened inside of one man rather than between a mystic and some other person. And now for tonight's moral du jour. A man who can tell himself to shut up is on the track of something. A man who can make himself shut up has down there discovered it. Mm -hmm. Update of a story we co covered earlier this month. One man had two wild beasts which he couldn't control, so he sicked them on one another. 
But in one state it is forbidden to sick one animal on another. Hey, it's just an update. One man who studied and pondered matters such as we discuss here, one day had his body say to him that it wished he would quit thinking about it as something separate from his other parts. And as he began to consider this, his mind spoke up to say that it felt the same way about his thinking of it as something separate from his other parts. So now the man had two things to think about regarding his thinking about himself, which he had never thought about before. It's never too late to think. And it's never too early to think. It's also never too late or early not to think. If you know what you're doing. Myth tells of an ancient band of extraordinary adventurers and fly catchers whose guiding principle was summed up in their secret motto, Hey, let go of my coat. <clears throat> if new ideas do not produce new energy in you, then they are a waste of time and the type of waste that the few can ill afford. According to certain legends, man was originally born with only one eye. But as he evolved and more responsibilities were placed on him, he came to have two eyes. And the same myths also indicate that he actually developed more than the two, but for some reason, they can't be seen. Leastwise by normal eyesight. In this universe, a function divided against itself can function quite well and nicely all the same. A lad asked his father, why is guilt such a common and continuing emotion with man? Efficiency of production, he replied, yes, sir. Efficiency, God have mercy on us, of production. As you may have suspected, there is a way whereby you do not fight the flow and yet are not swept away by it. On his invisible living headstone, one man has inscribed planets out of orbit, Rivers out of bed, traffic off the highway, someone wipe my head. Clean. A man cornered a mystic and said, Why has it been written that what is learned from the Enlightenment is nothing special? And the mystic said, That's very interesting. But I'm not sure the man got it. There was once a mighty ship, which had a mighty captain, who all believed controlled the ship but who in truth did not. And one of the ways by which this illusion survived was by the captain being required to watch himself. <laughs> all normal ships have a rigid rudder, while a few have ones that go all loose and limp. <laughs> there was once a man who wanted to capture a wild, beautiful bird. He tried two different approaches. First, he tried to grab it. Then he tried not grabbing it and found that they both had their merits. In certain forests, logic divided against itself becomes twice as logical. Yeah. Regarding the direction of things, there are no one-way streets. Not in this universe. How civilization is held together the normal cows in every herd are actually cut in two. The mind, the mind. What new can we say about the thing? The mind. The only creature known that is capable of infinite cannibalism. A man so mused, if we can live in no other time but now, and we can be nowhere other than here, why do men believe otherwise? And more, he mused. Is it a matter of something they believe or something they feel? They think. Why is it that we can live in no time but now and can be nowhere other than here, and yet men do not realize it? There was once a man who received a package, which at first he thought was a gift. Later, he began to suspect it to be a bomb. But being unable to get the thing completely unwrapped, he could never tell for sure. And now for tonight's chapter in, the history of the transcendental. 
There was once a mystical lodge whose people were known as the Great Unwrappers. <laughs> oh yeah, it's alleged that their senior members went by the secret name of the Grand Disposers of Packages That Are Wrapped. <laughs> there was once a man who wanted to discover new worlds and employed two varying approaches. Sometimes he actually went out searching for them, while at other times he simply stayed where he was and waited for them to come to him. A certain man sought instruction from a mystic and implored him, tell me about the mind, tell me about the mind. And the mystic replied, exactly what do you wish to know about the mind? And the man said, everything, everything. And right there is the problem, said the mystic, with the mind. Just a threat. Regarding the velocity of things. Once past the speed of light, to go faster requires you become deliberate. Or maybe not. It's all according. If new crises do not produce new energy in you, then you have totally wasted them. And this is most definitely the type of waste that you can never afford. <clears throat> the general flow of life urges man, give in, give in. It's the right thing to do, plus it's the easiest. Mm. Would life lie to you? <laughs> when a man asked a mystic to tell him the secret, the mystic replied, come back when there's no one around but me. <laughs> but I'm not sure that the man got it. A man came to a mystic and asked him the meaning of life. And the mystic answered, The meaning of life is to be found at that place beyond which there is no more meaning. And I think that this time, the man got something. Regarding the timing of things, if you check with your watch, it's already too late. On a slow day, in private, while in a fairly decent mood, a mystic asked himself, what does it take to do this besides being crazy? No. Then chulip for a moment and thought, no, let's change that. What does it take to do this besides being extraordinary? And pondered even further, then thought, nope, rewrite. What does it take to do this besides actually being quite ordinary? but was still dissatisfied and thought. No, what it takes to do this, in part, is to quit asking such questions. <laughs> and then thought, well, finally, congratulations, you at last got something right. <laughs> and accepted this semi-sarcastic felicitation inasmuch as it was about the best he could expect from the likes of him. A mystic divided against himself is like, well, two mystics, I guess. <laughs> there were, was once two knightly orders on opposite sides of a river. One taught the approach of charging the enemy and taking control. And the other relied on the collapse and disappear method. The rules of combat at higher levels are not what you'd expect. And lastly, tonight's transcendental consumer tip. The son of an awakened man asked, when I grow up, can I be empty too? And as he turned off the gas pump, his father replied, can is a mighty big word. UL approved. <clears throat> Had a viewer send in a right good question that I'll try to get through. There's a point past which, uh, talking about man in parts, such as about the body and the mind, and those of you who insist on 
fiction, uh, the emotions. But there's a point past which that it is ill-serving. But as long as you talk about certain, as long as you talk about any aspects of humanity, then you have to make such divisions based upon the way the mind works. So once again, I was going to return to the general area of thought and emotions. And reminding you that even though emotions certainly, as people call them, they exist. Because the fact is, whatever man collectively says exists, exists. And you're an idiot. Or else your main hobby is wasting your energy to have any complaint with it. Even if it appears from, let us say, an objective, an almost objective view, if what they're talking about appears ridiculous, such as religion, from one view. The idea of a personalized God somewhere. That from certain views, you can say, well, that's just absolutely you know, it's ridiculous. How can grown people say such things? But you're wasting your time because it's not ridiculous. It's not anything. If that is a large number of people claim to believe such and such, then it's real. But you can see emotions, although they are now considered real, but there's no way in which you can see emotions is that they are nothing more than physical survival instincts combined with thought. And the only reason I draw the distinction, even though it is ultimately spurious and specious, as I said, that past a certain point, it serves no purpose to keep doing that. You just either see what man is or you don't, or else you spend the rest of your life riding a thoughtful merry-go-round, perhaps looking quite reflective, but with cotton candy all over your face and ultimately <laughs> dizzy. Of course, if you don't get off, you never know how dizzy you are. Yeah. As long as you stay on it, you're all right. Mm -hmm. It's when you try and step off, it's what happens to many quite ordinary sane people as they attempt at odd times to step off the merry-go-round. You know, and do such things as, you know, like try to think. And they find themselves extremely dizzy and have to jump forthwith back on the old carousel. That is, to get back in the flow, to let the flow run unimpeded through their mind. But emotions, the reason I bring up the distinction again, or to remind you, is that emotions do not, while we're in this ad hoc vicinity of speaking of the body and the mind and the emotions as being in some way separate, then Emotions on that same comparable basis do not exist as a discrete entity in the same way that we could speak of the body and, the th and thoughts. In one way you can see emotions, I can describe it almost another way, which I have in the past, so don't think that you're confused. But there is one way in which you can see the evolution of man and of each individual is going from the body, where we all start and where we all end up going from the body, and then the next evolution is the mind. And that then it's like it went back, went back a loop and picked up emotions that it had to have both for there to be emotions. Because it was, it was not a simple outgrowth from survival instincts into what we call emotions, because emotions cannot exist, which is the distinction, if you care to ever see it, that I'm using. It's, it's operational, it's observable. So-called human emotions do not exist unless there's some thought involved. That is the function. That is the functional distinction. And there's no doubt about it. Because ordinary people, it happens so fast they do not notice it. And if you ask them, they start thinking about it and so belie what I'm about to say. But people have quite physical sensations, pleasures, the survival, sex being a great one, or eating after a good meal. And... As I made note in ordinary annals of literature, there are uh, no shortage of records of people making some little comment, just ordinary authors and observers, that uh, there are certain kinds of pleasures, or the most common one in the area to which I'm inferring is that people noting that oftentimes right after sex is almost as though the mind stops. 
and they feel extremely refreshed, not just the physical pleasure, but they notice it's almost I can lay there and every complaint I have in the world, everything, you know, there was some, something great. My business is falling apart. My wife's about to leave me and take everything I got. But being here with you, babe, I get through with a good screw. And it's like for a few seconds or some time you don't even know, but it's like everything is gone. Which, of course, is why men, and now I guess women too, but men pay so dearly, literally and otherwise, for sex. That's why life continues to go on with no shortage of additional little nippers showing up on this planet. No shortage of pregnant people. But what I was going to say is, that is the difference if you're looking at sex as strictly a survival instinct, strictly a physical pleasure. If you look at it that way, it requires no thought. That is also, by the way, in case you hadn't figured out why, Life has made man, collectively, at the civilized level, disapprove, historically, throughout the ages, of pornography. Which, forget all morality and all that, you know all it is, is life does not want man to get too involved with mixing up sex with thought. Because it waters it down. And I'm not talking about, well, I am talking about, I'm including, but I mean, you don't have to go so far as what is considered to be pathological. But I assume you all know that there are people... They have to be civilized. Think about this. You do not find it out in less civilized areas. But there are people who cannot perform sexually unless they have some external stimuli such as pornography. That's not at all unusual. and It's not a new phenomenon. There's traces of that thousands of years ago. But that is possible. And that happens. The point being, that's like the extreme. But I was just trying to point out that somewhere this side of the extreme, you notice there is a continuing throughout the ages of man running debate about should we allow pornography. And generally, the attitude is no. Areas get civilized, and they have to come up with a reason why, and it's always a religious or a moralistic reason. Well, that's just not good, which is one of those things that w will not withstand any attempted analysis. It's almost as weak as religion. Just If you try to be objective just for a second, think, wait a minute. What's wrong with pictures of people having sex? Well, God don't want you to. Oh, okay. The thing is, they, life does not want past a certain point, in this case sex, but if you understand, it does not want physical instincts that combine to such a degree with thought, which is the realm of emotion, not sex. At any rate, it runs the risk of being a detriment to sex. Now, I have to take care of it. Don't worry about it. You don't have to go out in the street and march against pornography even if you've got a closet full at, of it at home and you think, well, wait a minute. I, I see now the need, so we should keep it out of the hands of the riffraff, the, you know, the bourgeoisie. <laughs> I'm sure life will appreciate your efforts, but it's not needed. Life knows how to do it. At any rate, for those of you who cared to see... Uh, not only sex, that's just the probably easiest to describe, but what is called human emotions are always physical instincts, survival instincts mixed with thought. So if you've got emotions, you've got thought. You cannot have emotions without there being some thought involved, whereas you can have the sensation, which you do, or even the pleasures, if you want to look at it the way, of many of the survival instincts, eating, sleeping, sex, and it does not require thought. Thought may be there. I mean, if you're ordinary, thought's something, you know, doing something. But it is not required. You do not have to combine, push it back to the stream for a second, we'll get off of it, but I want to make sure that you do see that this is quite simple to perceive. In the same way that there's some people, as I said, uh, that cannot perform sexually, cannot get aroused, men, let's say, without pornography. Or even if they just have to dream. We all know that old joke, you know, that a man you know, closes his eyes and he dreams of, you know, he's got 14 uh, naked Girl Scouts in bed or some movie actress instead of whoever he's in bed with. That that is, he has to bring in thought to actually perform one of the survival instincts. All right. It's requiring thought, you understand? The thing is, now, if you see the comparison, an ordinary man does not have to picture food if he's hungry. He does not have to, you know, he, somebody brings a meal, a, veg, you know, a vegetable plate, some mashed potatoes and peas, and him look at it and go, ooh, and he has to kind of close his eyes, and while nobody's watching, he dreams of a Big Mac or 
in other words, you know, well, I, I assume you see. All right, back to what we were talking about. Emotions springing, being an outgrowth, even though it's combined with thought, they are an outgrowth, you can see it quite easily, of survival instincts combined with emotion, I mean with thought. But having the, the purpose it serves collectively right now is best described, it covers everything, is to say that emotions collectively serve as a civilizing influence on man. It is from this that ordinary, that everyone originally derives their sense of I, which I should have opened it, said tonight we would, tonight's commentary and program will be devoted to the question of, is a man's I created by civilization or by the mind? So pretend that that was the opening. Emotions collectively speaking, serve as the seat of people's, ordinary people's, sense of themselves. That when ordinary people, which is everybody originally, no matter if you're not absolutely ordinary now, but everyone's sense of who they are, every time that people say I, they are speaking as a spokesman, of course for life, but they're speaking as a spokesman of the local employer, <coughs> civilization. Because I ends up, I is, is basically one thing. It is a controlling mechanism. It is something that now, that you must have an intellect. You must have the brain operating to have a sense of I. Because if you can't say I, if you can't think I, you have no I. And if we found such people, which is part of the intrigue of the stories of trying to find the wild boy of Malta or Saint Tropez. <laughs> I don't know why... Those French psychologists always discovering wild boys living with animals out in the wilds and the woods and the, the bucolic areas of France. But how, if you're going to be a wild boy, I figure you should be down around San Tropez or Morocco. Now that's where to be wild. But anyway, get serious. If you think about this, which people never do, by and large, it's just almost, this is almost a totally unconditional statement. Man's sense of I, it's certainly from the mind, or I put it this way, without the mind you could not have it. And its primary purpose, its overriding purpose, it, just, it is almost exclusive. There's just a small amount of usable freedom, but it's down there exclusive purpose is for the mind to override the instincts of the body. Think about, and it doesn't matter whether you're fairly gregarious or whether you seem to be shy and withdrawn. If you begin to see it, your normal sense of I is really like a kind of preparation that, uh, H that is being spread on the physical survival instincts. None of you, well, everybody's experienced this, I'll put it to you rhetorically, but none of you have begun to feel something. Now, everybody feels confined. Everybody, we all have been through this that throughout history and up until today, people always feel like that they are captive of something or they want freedom. That, God, I just, I wish I could just be freer. And nobody can answer why. If you say, well, how are you not free? Well, I don't know. You know, we live in a place you've got uh, almost total political, economic freedom, you just go almost anywhere you want to, you can just do almost anything you want to. It's the most open society known to man. Yeah, I know. But, damn, don't you feel it sometimes? And that people do, and they go, yeah, but nobody knows what. That alone should be interesting. That alone would get, or should get, if people actually thought, if people were actually intelligent, that if ordinary people actually had the ability to objectively reflect upon the nature of human existence, that alone should be the primary hobby. Forget sports and cross-eyed puzzles, or whatever you call them. That should be the hobby. It's considering what is it that I feel I am so captive of. And since man has had four or five thousand years of recorded history to answer that and cannot, what the hell, I'll do it. You know what you're captive of? You know what you feel confined by? I. 
And yet, right now, right here in Norway, we're probably one of the freest societies on this planet. You know damn well you can walk out in the street here, downtown Oslo. You can say anything you want to. You can say, screw the prime minister, screw the queen. Is she still around? Yeah. You can say, screw everybody. And if you don't like that, screw you twice. And in fact, in Norway, you can get there. <laughs> and within reason, if you don't overdo it, you can probably take off your clothes right outside this building. Take off your clothes, stand there naked, and then say, screw the prime minister. <laughs> screw everybody. And chances are, if that's all you do is, I mean, how, how much freer can you be? So you can holler, screw God, screw the church, screw the queen, screw the United Nations. <laughs> screw everybody. And then you can you know, kind of shake yourself and make sure everybody sees you're nude and go, screw you all. <laughs> I, what I'm trying to get at, you think, well, in one sense, you, know, you can burn you know, the declaration of Norwegian independence. You can burn pictures of the queen. You can burn pictures of God if you got any on you. <laughs> I'm just trying to say you can, you can almost do anything that you want to. But if we can have it both ways, if you did that and you're still an ordinary person, work with me. All right, just, just use, it as a, use it as a mental pretend game. You do know... I mean, I could ask you, I'd say, well, now, what more can a person do? And yet you do know if a, if a sane person did that, just an ordinary person, you know that would not, you would not come back in. I'm sure it would give you some sort of rush. But when you came back in, five minutes later, you're not going to feel any different about this sense that something is confining you. Because the confinement rests in the very place that senses confinement. The mind the mind is constructed, a man's personality, is constructed to be constrictive. It is constructed to be a sense of confinement. We have not left the area of emotions. Now let's go back, as I said, because in one sense you can see that man started out living in the body, then the mind got going, and that's almost as though life said, well, let's go back. It would be more efficient. And it's like then they looped back, went back and picked up the physical instincts and brought it back up halfway between there and the brain, between the thought processes, and from that evolved emotion. Perhaps I just stop, stay here one more minute or two. I want you to understand this is not an attack and it's not a theory. You can see it. You can feel it, which is better or if it's an ordinary person, it'd be worse. But this feeling of confinement, this feeling that every ordinary person has, it does not necessarily drive them crazy or run their life, so to speak. But people who get involved with this, it does become an area that is extremely sensitive, whether you think about it in these terms or not. But it's a feeling that you're imprisoned, more so than ordinary people. Because by now, I'm assuming I'm addressing an audience of people who have some sensation some personal understanding that life is alive, that there is a flow of life going on over which men have no control, but over which they are made to think otherwise. And if there's nothing wrong with that, it serves the purpose once you see the purpose. But then when, if you have some knowledge of this and you've given up fighting unreasonable, illogical foes, arguing with that which deserves no argument, then you begin to feel an intense, an intensified sensation of confinement that you know god damn i'm getting you feel more and more irritated in a sense not in the comments but more and more that you know i got a guy here i gotta do something i gotta move i gotta get to istanbul i gotta get awakened i gotta get enlightened and it's always like something's holding me we can describe all kinds of manifestations of it habit distraction but the seat of all captivity is the mind or if it helps tonight, your personality. That is its primary purpose, is to oversee, to govern, to hold down physical survival instincts. Think about it. The very thing 
which people do not think about. But the very thing that is also worthy of thinking about is where do you get your sensation of you, which I'm not going to get into. People think it's an easy answer. If you say, how do you know you're you? And ordinary, ordinary sane people will give you a very quick reply. No, they'll give you a reasonably fast reply. And yet if you think about it, there is no reply. If you have, again, anything resembling intelligence, you cannot answer that question from any ordinary level of where you get your sensation of you. All you can do is begin to stumble around and give examples. But a person who has any ability to think, it will narrow down to one place in your head that that is the only place you've got a sensation, but then to say, well, it's a mental image. If you can think, that's not a sufficient answer. It is really, it's not taken from an answer, it's taken from a, like a dynamic. It's not a man's sense of what he is, is not actually a noun. It's really a verb, because his sense of what he is, I thought I said I wasn't getting into this. You lied. Well, I'm not getting into it very far. <laughs> A man's real sense of what he is, one reason he can't answer is it's not a thing. Even when you say I, and even though you got one body and you think, well, this is me, that is not from what it derives. It derives over a series of actions to what you're, rather than, as opposed to a man's sense of what he is being an, a thing, an object, a noun, compared to that, it's really based upon action. Of him a verb, that is, his sense of what he is, is a sense of what he will do, of what he expects of himself. What he, what he just normally, or he doesn't analyze it, but he expects that if I go out right now with these people and I go such and such, or somebody calls me on the phone and asks me so and so, you don't analyze this, but your sense of you is based on what you will do. Watch it. So a man's personality ends up serving a purpose of which people are never aware. That the very purpose of this thing that seems to be free compared to the body, we know the body is not free. To believe that the body is free in some way is a sign of psychosis. It's a sign you're not sane. Anybody who knows anything at all knows the body is almost an absolutely locked in piece of mechanism. No offense to it, it works beautifully. But the more you try to involve yourself with operations of the body, uh, the less efficient it is. So just look at the body, just runs quite well. It runs at the max without any thought being given to it. Without any active participation of the mind. Compared to that, and it's a fair comparison, then the only chance a man has, the only area of any possible freedom is the mind. It's only the mind that can think of things that are even detrimental to you. It can think about it. The mind, if the, the mind can think of drinking poison. The mind can, can contemplate suicide and not hurt itself. Whereas the body cannot drink poison and not hurt itself. It cannot drink it and then go, I was just fooling. But the mind can think, I'll drink poison. I'll drink poison, I'll stagger around the room, I'll, yeah, and I'll, call, I'll call the last person that hurt my feelings or did me wrong. I'll call my mother or somebody, and I'll go, I just drank poison. <laughs> Boy, I hope you're happy now. And I'll, yeah, and I'll die. And I'll come close to dying. Everybody will be, they'll be heartbroken and screaming and running around. <laughs> oh, well, I think I'll go get something to eat. No harm done. The point seems to be that the mind is free. The mind can do, it can imagine and do anything. And that is a ball-faced distraction. The mind is, if, it seems as though, and from one view, which I point out easily, from one view, that is the purpose of the intellect, of the mind, is that it can think of things that do not yet exist, which is one of the ways in which man has progressed, technically. That the mind can think of the future. The mind can look at things that are here now and put them together in his mind. Not even in a workshop yet. But in his mind can put together things that are presently extant. Put them together in new ways and picture how they'll operate. And then put it together and sure enough it does. 
So the mind is free, right? Not hardly. A man's mind is the very thing that is in charge of clamping down, of controlling freedom. It is, I'm going to have to leave this. The mind is the very thing from which all feelings of captivity arise. And the mind's primary purpose is to be in charge of captivity. What else can you say? It's like a prison guard. He works in a prison, lives there, but he, that's his job. And he keeps having this feeling that he's confined. But how can he ever realize it? He was born there, he was born into the job, and that's his job. And he dreams all the time of freedom, and he feels as though he is confined, but he can never realize it. Because being a prison guard is his job. You understand? His life. He knows no other life. And so dream all he wants to. But he never realizes that I'm a prison guard. Emotions coming from being an offshoot, not of the mind. But they must have thought with them, recall. But they are an offshoot. They outgrow from survival instincts. But as it is now, I know I've already brought this up, and I'm going to leave it as a challenge for you to see. As it is now, human emotions do not have a specific purpose for the individual. Not anything comparable to the purpose that they serve with man collectively, which is the civilizing of man. That collectively, and it's easy to see, the emotions are in charge of making man more civil. If he was simply, if Let's separate thought, cut it out of the picture for a second. If, I, if man still was operating by survival instinct alone, which many times uh, emotions masquerade, or they are hidden in what seems to be emotion. But if that was the only sensations that men had, you know damn well we would not be civilized. We would not be staying here now. We would be, still be at each other's throats. We would be at the same level as animals. So collectively, it has quite well served. But you can see easily that if there's one thing emotions do do, that doesn't sound very nice, but <laughs> hey, emotions are not nice. I'm glad I said it. Do do. I thought emotions were about to turn on me and get even. Ha! The one thing emotions do accomplish is the civilizing of inf the civilizing effect that is what they have on man one of the primary ways in which it is done is guilt but it does it in all the other ways that people call human emotions that separate from animal passion sympathy love charity all of those things they serve as a civilizing influence but they are in direct contradiction they're opposed to survival instincts if they were pure and direct. But if you look at, look at yourself, the question is, human emotions, what good, what purpose have they served to me individually? But do not confuse the joys of physical pleasure with emotion because they're two different things. And this is not to say that people shouldn't be as happy as they want to be or as happy as they can be. But the so-called human emotions, the question is, that I'm leaving with, I'm not going to try to prove it in some way. But I am stating, and you can take it as your own basis for investigation, that the things that ordinary people call human emotions, those that if we had ordinary sane people here, or a spokesman for all of humanity, and they did follow what I was saying, that there is a difference between survival instinct, just the passions that we share with animals, like the sexual urge, the urge to eat. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, what you people call emotions that are separate from that, and they go, yeah. And I say, all right, whatever they are, you name them, I'll accept them. If you say that's what they are, I accept it. You do the same. Now think about those emotions that you and everyone else would respond to on the basis of that question, that you would list as emotions, not physical passion, not physical sensation, and then ask yourself, has it, have they benefited you individually in any way whatsoever? 
and rather than me just say yes or no, I'll repeat what I've already said. They do not, at this time, human emotions do not serve any specific purpose for the benefit of an individual. Uh... Trying to get to this question. If you see somewhere around the area that I'm referring to, then you're left with this. That is, if it's people that will assume attempting to do whatever this sort of thing is involved with. Once you see that emotions just left on their own serve no purpose to you beneficially, and yet they're there, it's not a matter of saying, well, I won't have them anymore. <laughs> well, okay. Qu quit breathing. Or anybody's going to quit having emotions like that, then uh, I would certainly like to shake your hand after the get through taping because that means that you have already stopped all the mental flow. In other words, you're not burdened by mechanical thinking. You're not burdened by the brain continuing to fire night and day, 24 hours a day, Seven days a week in most cases. <laughs> <laughs> Taking in the allowance sometimes uh, an extraordinary weekend for people here and there, so I hear. Because that doesn't actually mean that the brain quit firing at men. It's just like the ammunition got so soggy and it's, <laughs> it's like warfare out in the trenches in World War I out in Belgium when it's been raining for two weeks straight. I don't know. You figure it out. At any rate, <laughs> if, you're, if you're attempting to do something yourself, then emotions are here. You have them. It's not a matter of saying, well, I'll stop it. It's a matter of making some use, of creating some use for them to take the very things that go through men that they seem to experience, anger, fear, sorrow, regret. And I... I could list the, what seems to be the more positive ones, like happiness and et cetera. But you, if you notice, other than just very ephemeral, brief spurts that I'm about to get to in this question, what's known as happiness, what people call happiness, if I said you've got to learn if you're going to do anything extraordinary, if you're going to make any real assault on expanding what you are, individually, secretly, individually, then you've got to be able to use emotions. And the ones I listed, you've got to be able to create a use because right now they've got no individual use. And so I mentioned uh, anger, fear, regret, sorrow. And if somebody said, well, what happened to the positive emotions? The positive emotions, if you look at them, they're all, it's almost impossible for you not to see, they are directly based on physical instinct, other than momentary, such as figuring out a cross-eyed puzzle, yes. remembering something that you forgot, being able to theoretically come up with a new invention or a solution to a plan, that sort of thing. But what people actually say is happiness. What are they? Uh, you'll have to see again for yourself. It's not that hard to see. There is a wide variance between what sounds to be... Uh, non-pleasurable emotions that no one would say, no sane person would say that they find uh, fear, sorrow, anger, well, unless they're in it. And any good sorehead really enjoys being mad. We all know that. <laughs> well, at least some of us do. But if you're not actually in its stores, or Birmingham, Alabama, well, there's some areas in which it's easier and seems to be more suitable to be extremely angry than others. For some reason, Birmingham, Alabama came to mind as opposed to, say, Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> but perhaps it's a matter of taste, or it could be a matter of geography, or it could be a matter that you don't know, have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll guess which of the three it was. <clears throat> By the way, if you don't understand, if you do not get that, my advice to you is do not wander the streets of Birmingham late at night alone. Just a suggestion. There is a difference that you can see between 
the, the motions I listed. Someone could say, well, you, all you did was list the uh, nine positive ones, negative emotions, hostile emotions, and what happened, wh why can't we use the good ones? Well, first off, you gotta see that there is something very strange between what people would normally insist, ordinary people, not that they're not correct from their view, that ordinary people insist would be good emotions. I guess they would say love. Of course, actually, I don't know what the hell they, what would they say, love? Uh, and you're just about left with happiness. Well, just being happy. So, all right, I'll let that go. There only seems to be like one or, or two positive emotions, but the negative ones, you can talk until we get bored with it. Think about that. The point is, you can't use the happy ones. I'll have to get into that some other time. There's no way that you can use what seems to be happy emotions. Not, not to make any change in yourself. The only thing you can use are crises, calamities. Of small. It has to be what appears to be non-pleasurable, or else there's no energy available. Uh, that was supposed to take an, an hour, but I won't get to this too because it's tied to just what I'm saying. Question from a viewer. There's a kind of satisfaction, which I, you'll see that they mean, I'll go ahead and add, they mean it's non-physical. Satisfaction. In fact, I would wish they would have put happiness, which if you'll follow, I'm not trying to change the meaning of what they did. But satisfaction is really the only time that that would really be applicable, using my terminology just for the time being. Not that I'm right and Miriam and Webster's incorrect, but in the sense that I'm using it now, satisfaction would only be physical as opposed to happiness. It's only the body, it's only physical instincts that can be satisfied. Nothing else actually can be satisfied in the sense that it's done for and that's it. But at any rate, they said there's a kind of satisfaction, and may I say happiness, that comes from finally succeeding at something you've tried really hard to do or from learning how to do something challenging or just when you feel that you did a really good job of something. It feels like an emotion. They're responding to something I've been saying that I sort of mentioned tonight. They're saying this feels like emotion as opposed to what they were taking I'd said before or inferred. It feels like an emotion and it doesn't obviously seem to be attributable to other people. Where does this fit in with comments you've made, etc.? Does there one follow? Because I even did point out, you know, some in passing, that there are what seems to be some pleasures. Be on the body. Be on the body. Because they, the body, obviously, one, that's the only one that I'm pointing out again that actually deserves its hungers. Its pot potentials are the only ones that can actually be satisfied in the sense, as I point out, that if you are horny, to use technical terminology, and you engage in sex, when you're through, you're satisfied. If you're just an ordinary person and you just have ordinary sex, just a run of the mill sex, just as common, just as missionary positioned as possible, just as square, just do it. Wham, bam, thank you, sir. <laughs> to retrieve it from its erstwhile sexist basis, that cliche. At any rate, when you're through, you're satisfied. When you're hungry, you eat and you're satisfied. In the mind, there seems to be something similar, which the person was trying to point out and asking about. And I, and I will admit, or I'd already point out, there seems to be pleasure, or there is pleasure, and I'll say that, in doing things intellectually. It's not all that common. The world is not overly populated by people who get intellectual pleasure or pleasure from the mind. The mind is just a, something that's there with most people. And their pleasures are the body. You cannot call the mind satisfied, though. You cannot say that you do something. Now, the person pointed out, and we all know, you do know that, and we'll assume anybody would listen to this for any length of time, you do have a very active intellect, that you are not part of the common herd of humanity. And so you all know that you have had much intellectual fun of either figuring out something yourself or finally understanding something, getting a job done just right. Of course, that gets a little if it because the job done right is almost always going to require some physical activity. And so there was some pleasure there. But let's try to keep it strictly at 
that you were trying to do logic puzzles, mental games, or you were trying to picture that you had some problem and you, could, you figured it out intellectually. You were not in a laboratory, you were not mixing chemicals, it was not a hands-on technological challenge, but it was something that you could do purely intellectually. We all know that can be real fun. It can be fun just to pick up a book and be reading something. So you picked up some book on philosophy or by some mystic somewhere, and you start reading, and somebody stated an idea that triggered something in you. And you all know you can get up and it'd be so much fun, you have to stand up and walk outside and smoke a cigarette or go out and you know, spit or whistle. And you think, God, where, you know how great, what fun. You cannot call that satisfaction. That's why I'm trying, I'm not playing with words, because it does not satisfy. The mind cannot be satisfied. So there is pleasure. You can get happiness from other things. We don't have time to get into, so I just state my same challenge. The body can obviously be, enjoy great pleasure and in fact be satisfied, and the mind certainly can have joys and pleasures. Notice this, the emotions are just about left out in the back with no cold biscuit, and they won't even let them have to sleep <laughs> under the porch. And people believe otherwise. They will insist otherwise, but you know, they will not ever look at it just for a few seconds, objectively. What pleasures do emotions, as they're normally called, give me? Back to this. So the mind, which is the base of this question, that mental activity can seem to give, not satisfaction, I assume you got what I'm saying, but seem to give happiness. And the person ends up saying it feels like an emotion, which I, in a sense, I can understand why somebody would think that I denied that a few nights ago. But consider, here is the key to all of this, if I didn't get too confused. Happiness does. I mean, happiness is easily, what else are we going to call it? Now, we're discounting physical satisfaction now. But happiness, it seems to be unique to man. The things that he can do, pleasures that he seems to uh, experience that animals do not. So, let's call it happiness. So, happiness certainly classifies as an emotion. But, here it is. Emotions don't cause happiness. 